um, Nadine is. Are we ready? Or? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. What's wrong with my mic? Good morning. <laughs> the mic's not working. I've got it on. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. No. no. <laughs> Thanks. Test. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, it's working. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thanks for the uh, brief indulgence. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. My name is Ann Morgan. I'm the chair of the Toronto Police Services Board. I'd like to welcome you uh, all to this hybrid meeting of the board. I would like now to do our Indigenous land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land we are on as we hold this meeting is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashnabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and it's home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. The board also acknowledges that the Tor Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signs, signed by the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Um, <coughs> Are there any declarations of interest under the Manifa Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, uh, let me proceed. Um, I will turn it over to the board's executive director, Dr. Doobie Cannon Gisser, and he will go over today's meeting logistics. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us in person, as well as those who have called into this meeting. Please note that this meeting is also being live streamed on the Toronto Police YouTube account and will be available there at the conclusion of this meeting. Joining us in person, we have Chair Ann Morgan, Acting Vice Chair, it's not acting, sorry, it's Vice Chair. Yeah. Vice Chair Lisa Kostakis, Member uh, Nick Migliori, um, uh, Councillor Lily Cheng, um, and joining us virtually is member Nadine Spencer. We're awaiting Councillor John Burnside and Deputy Mayor Amber Morley to join us soon. Um, we also have members of our board office staff, Chief Demke and his command team, members of the service, and of course, members of the public. We have individuals who have registered to make deputations both in person as well as virtually on our agenda items. As per our regular meeting process, deputations will be heard prior to the item being discussed and voted on by board members. When it comes time to do a deputation, those who have registered will be called upon and are brought into the meeting. And as always, deputants will speak, followed by an opportunity for board members to ask questions. Chair. Thank you, Doobie. At this time, I would like to play tribute to two officers recently and tragically lost their lives. RCMP Constable Frederick, Rick O'Brien, as well as PC Greg Mills from the Hamilton Police Service who died by suicide. I should note that while I did mention Constable Rick O'Brien at our budget meeting on September 25th, at this time, I'd like to talk about him a little more fully. RCMP Constable Rick O'Brien was a seven-year member of the Ridge Meadows RCMP detachment in Metro Vancouver. He was married to the love of his life, Nicole, and was a devoted father of their six children. He was killed in the line of duty on September 22nd of this year while executing a search warrant in Coquitlam. Constable O'Brien was known for his pure soul, his great healing hugs, his kind and gentle demeanor, and for having a heart of gold. He built a beautiful, blended family with his wife. Prior to his service in the RCMP, Constable O'Brien had worked as a teacher, a mental health worker, and a youth worker. Constable O'Brien was very proud of being a police officer. He loved everything about it, and he wore his uniform with great pride. He wanted to show people that police officers were humans, always demonstrating kindness, compassion, and patience. He truly wanted people to know that they matter, 
and that they could change their lives for the better. At his funeral held in Langley, BC on October 4th, Constable O'Brien's family said he was very quick to laugh and even quicker to love. By all accounts, he was known for his youthful vitality, his amazing smile, his love of sports, and his sarcastic sense of humor. Constable O'Brien was a thoroughly adoring husband who enjoyed a storybook love with his wife, Nicole. Constable Rick O'Brien was a hero in life. Constable O'Brien's genuine dedication and desire to help others, particularly children and vulnerable people, left a lasting and credible impact on both his colleagues and the community at large. It's not lost on any one of us in this room that once again we are grieving the loss of a police officer in this country. And this is happening with heartbreaking frequency. We should never fail to remember that each one of these officers mattered immensely to their friends, to their families, to their colleagues, that Constable O'Brien's life was not just one of the many of the tragically long list. His life was everything. At the same time, those tragic deaths, both individually and collectively, take a toll on us, but mostly especially on the broader and stronger connected policing community. We stand beside our service members in the policing community countrywide in honoring the lives that have been sacrificed in the name of public safety. Our thoughts and our hearts are once more with our own members as they continue to cope with this devastating and merciless loss of life. We pay tribute to Constable O'Brien, his youthful, fun, and compassionate spirit, his bravery, his incredible commitment to his job, and at the ultimate sacrifice, serving and protecting the community he so loved. I would like also to pay tribute to PC Greg Mills of the Hamilton Police Service, who tragically died by suicide on September 27th. Known as a friendly, generous, and very uh, extremely outgoing, PC Mills worked in Frontline Patrol, the Mounted Unit, CIB, and is an instructor at the Ontario Police College teaching recruits. But despite his positive, friendly exterior, it's clear now inside he was struggling. He was a fighting a battle that he could not win. We honor his valuable, important life, and we grieve his heartbreaking loss acknowledging the enormous impact that his death had on his family, the police service, his community, and as well as members of police services across the country very much, including ours. This agonizing loss is yet another series of heartbreaks within the Canadian policing community and to the Toronto police community, in particular after a long series of tragedies in the past year. We acknowledge policing's a unique and extremely intense career with our service members, both uniform and civilian, regularly experiencing and witnessing situations that involve trauma and tragedy. <coughs> we join the chief in encouraging our members to access the range of resources and supports offered by this service. As the employer, the board has the ultimate responsibility for health and safety of service members and this is a responsibility we do not take lightly. The board and board office will continue to support and enhance the services efforts to protect the mental health of its membership, including reducing stigma around seeking help and normalizing conversations about our mental health. So today we honor the life of PC Greg Mills, his remarkable contribution and his dedication to public safety. We recognize his overwhelming suffering, the challenges he faced, and his deep sadness. We grieve alongside his family, friends, loved ones, and colleagues, and the people left behind. And we vow once more to work to prevent this from ever happening again to one of our members. Uh, before we have a moment of silence, I would like to turn it over to Chief Damkew for some comments. Thank you, Madam Chair, your incredible, thoughtful words about these two fallen members from our police and community are a great tribute to the lives they led in service to their communities. The line of duty death of RCMP Constable Rick O'Brien shattered us all. 
On September 22nd, while many members from police services from across our country were making their way to Ottawa for the annual Canadian Police and Peace Officers Memorial, we learned of Constable O'Brien's tragic death. As you so eloquently said, Chair, Constable O'Brien's commitment to helping others, particularly the youth and the vulnerable members of his local community, makes his loss that much more painful. As a policing community, we are heartbroken for the families that have to endure life after losing a loved one in this way. Our hearts ache for the O'Brien family and for our colleagues in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. While words cannot undo what has been done, please know that we stand with you and we will never forget the sacrifice that Constable O'Brien made. He is a hero for so many reasons. Constable O'Brien is the seventh police officer in Canada to be killed in the line of duty this calendar year. A truly staggering number and a statistic that has a profound impact on every police officer in this country and has an impact on the communities. All of us are sworn to serve. Tragedy in the policing community is not limited to losing a member in a line of duty. Unfortunately, the reality for the policing community is that grief and tragedy are also experienced when we lose one of our own by suicide. As a police service, we have experienced the loss of members over the years who have died by suicide. It is a reality that causes myself, our entire command team, and the board a great deal of concern. On September 27th, the Hamilton Police Service lost one of their own who died by suicide. Police Constable Greg Mills was a 20-year veteran of the Hamilton Police Service who, in his two decades of service, positively impacted the community and his colleagues. Our hearts go out to the entire Hamilton Police Service, as well as Constable Mills' family, <clears throat> in the aftermath of their tragic loss. The loss of Constable Mills and the members of other police services who have died by suicide, including our own, must not be in vain. While we have come a long way in our understanding of and support of mental health, we must acknowledge that there is still much work to be done. As Chief, I am committed to making the mental health of our members a priority I am vocal about this. I meet with every recruit class. I personally speak to our recruits about the importance of taking care of their mental health. And I ask them to make a commitment to me that they will make their mental health a priority. I'm thankful, truly thankful, that we have a board that recognizes that the mental health of the members of our service needs to be a priority. Thank you, Chief. Um, so now, may we please stand, take a moment of silence to honor the two officers, Constable Rick O'Brien and PC Greg Mills. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> at, at this time, I would like to officially welcome Councillor John Burnside to our board. Councillor Burnside uh, was elected in 2022 as our city councillor for Ward 16, which is Don Valley East, and he's been a resident there for almost two decades. Previously, Councillor Burnside was the city councillor for the previous Ward 26, which was Don Valley West from 2014 to 2018. After graduating from the University of Western Ontario, Councillor Burnside spent 10 years as a police officer with Toronto Police Service, working in diverse communities. Councillor Burnside's been a tireless community leader and builder since his early 20s. He's especially passionate about helping underserved communities. 
His work in this area includes spearheading the creation of the Free House um, <coughs> League Hockey in Flemington Park, where in addition to helping find sponsors, Council Burnside engaged the Toronto Police Service to operate the league, which is now in its 15th season. It should be noted that Councilor Burnside was sworn in previously on August 21st in order for him to be able to take on his duties following his uh, council appointment. Today we're just recreating that public ceremony. So um, without further ado, maybe we can come to the front and I will uh, swear you in, Councilor Burnside. This is on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is the oath of office for Councillor Burnside. And repeat after me. I solemnly affirm that I will be loyal to His Majesty the King and to Canada. I solemnly affirm that I will be loyal to His Majesty the King and to Canada. And that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. And that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act, any other act, and any regulation, rule, or bylaw. Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act, and any other act, and any regulation, rule, or bylaw. And now the oath of secrecy. I solemnly affirm that I will not disclose any information obtained by me. I solemnly affirm that I will not disclose any information obtained by me. In the course of my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. In the course of my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. Except as I may be authorized or required by law. Except as I may be authorized or required by law. Welcome. That's <laughs> Welcome. That's it. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. We'll just sign. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, before I uh, review the uh, entire uh, agenda for holds and approvals, um, there are uh, two additional items for this meeting. Um, they were not included in the originally posted agenda, but we are asking these be included as part of a walk-on agenda due to their time-sensitive nature. And those two items are a City Council decision, MM11.37, keeping Toronto safe from hate. And the second one is a request for special funds, the 31st Annual Scholarship and Awards Gala. So at this time, I'd like to make a motion to include these reports on this agenda. Councillor, <laughs> Deputy Mayor Morley and uh, uh, Vice Chair Kostakis. Thank you, second. And now I will go uh, <laughs> through the, uh, the agenda for holds and approvals. Um, uh, the first um, is a hold because it is confirmation of the minutes from the regular public meeting. And um, we have um, Boris Elmo in person and Albert uh, Wenzel has uh, put in a written deputation only. The second item as well is the um, 2024 budget committee update and there are two deputations on item two. <coughs> Um, item three, again, is a um, uh, report from uh, Duby Cannon Gisser. It's as it relates to board member training, and we have two deputations on that, and there's a hold. Number four on the list is 
uh, an annual report on police training by Chief Demke, and we're going to hold, as we have, two uh, deputations on that. <coughs> um, number uh, five is, again, about the EJUST systems, uh, the case management system uh, support uh, contract um, to approve, and we do have um, a deputation. Uh, item number six, it is the uh, special consummal appointment and reappointments um, to date to October 23. Um, may I have a motion? <laughs> Deputy uh, Mayor Morley, can I have a seconder? Ms. Kostakis, and all in favor, thank you. Item number six, approved. Um, <clears throat> number seven is um, the jury's recommendations from the coroner's inquest into the death of Mr. Bo Aaron Baker. Uh, it's a report that was filed by Chief Demke. Um, may I have a motion to receive these recommendations? All right, thank you. <laughs> Number eight is the Chief's administrative investigative reports, items 8-1 through 8-4. Um, may I have a, a motion to approve? Thank you, Councillor Chang. I have a seconder. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Morley. So we've received those. <clears throat> and then the, uh, the final one were the uh, two walk-on reports to approve that uh, we just made a motion on. One was the City Council decision, MM11.37, uh, keeping Toronto safe from hate. Can I have a motion to approve? Um, Nick, um, and second. Okay, as long as it's, yeah, as long as, okay. Okay, we'll hold it then. And what about, then the second one, this is a report from uh, Duby Cannon Gisser. It relates to the request for special funds, 31st annual scholarship and awards gala. Can I have a motion to approve? Um, Lisa, seconder Nick. Thank you, all in favor. All right, and then uh, <coughs> we can go back to the beginning of the agenda. And, and uh, thank you, Chief. We'll hear your monthly verbal update. Thank you, Chair. And thank I'd like you. to start my uh, monthly update of, again welcoming uh, Council Burnside. It's uh, very, uh, very good to see you here. Congratulations on uh, joining us on the board. And as, as I've done for all members of the board, I want to ensure that you know that I'm always available and open to discuss uh, any, any issues related to policing matters that impact our incredibly great city. So always there to engage as necessary and looking forward to working with you and all the members of the board as we continue to deliver our service priorities and our overarching commitment to doing whatever we can to keep Toronto the best and safest place to live, work and play. <clears throat> On the morning of October 7th, we awoke to learn about the tragic and terrifying situation that was unfolding in the Middle East. The international community was horrified to learn about the attack on innocent Israeli civilians by the terrorist organization Hamas. Although over 9,000 kilometers away, the impact of these events has been felt deeply here in Toronto, where family members and friends of those living in the region worry about their loved ones. I've been meeting with members of the Jewish and Palestinian communities, and we continue to communicate. I've heard directly that they are not only concerned for their family and friends living in the conflicted regions, but they are also fearful, fearful for their own safety here in our city. With this understanding, over the course of the past almost two weeks, we have responded quickly to take steps to protect our communities. We have responded with an all of service state of readiness and have directed high visibility patrols and deployments across all divisions with a focus on places of worship, including synagogues, mosques, schools, and community centers. We've deployed two command posts to be in the community and available for people in the community to engage with our officers while out and about directed all officers to have uniforms and to be ready to be deployed at a moment's notice as operationally required. And we've maintained on our, our ongoing presence across the city. These measures will be in place for the foreseeable future. 
The number of hate crime calls for service in Toronto have increased since the attack on October 7th. Since this war began, the daily average of hate-related calls for service has increased by 132%. And I'd like to just take a moment now, Chair, and provide some statistical observations. The year-to-date numbers, January 1st to October 7th, were 237 hate crimes, as compared to last year, which were 192. Since October 7th to October 9th, we have seen an additional 12 reported hate crimes, forgive me, 14 reported hate crimes. And typically, year to date, last year we saw five at this time, over this period, and the year before that, we saw one during that same period. The breakdown is as follows. Out of the 14 occurrences since October 7th to today, 12 have been related to anti-Semitism. Two have been related to anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic events. This reflects an escalation in hate-motivated incidents and also heightened public tensions. Verified incidents of hate crimes, including mischief, uttering death threats, and criminal harassment are on the rise. We have been clear and we remain resolute. The Toronto Police Service will not tolerate acts of violence, intimidation, or hate toward anyone or any community. We will facilitate lawful protest. We will be vigilant and resolute in our service to our communities and the residents of this city. In times of crisis, I'm humbled on how strong the human spirit can be I'm grateful for the kindness our officers have experienced in our communities over the last two weeks. While on patrol in neighborhoods across the city, listening to concerns of community members out on the street and at command posts, or while visiting cultural centers, schools, and places of worship. Partnerships with communities are crucial to the effectiveness of our role as a police service, as are those we have with our policing partners, both provincially and federally. I am personally in touch with GTA chiefs, the OPP commissioner, the assistant commissioner of the RCMP for the province of Ontario. And in the past few weeks, we have enlisted support from our law enforcement partners here in the GTA, Durham, Halton, York, and Peel Regional Police Services, as well as the Ontario Provincial Police. Our community should know that law enforcement across our province are working in an integrated and supportive manner, manner, sharing information and resources to ensure the public safety. I will say that Ontario's policing agencies have an expertise that I firmly believe is second to none anywhere in North America, if not the world. We are committed to doing everything we can to ensure the public safety. And with that, I want to take a moment to offer my acknowledgement of our members, both uniform and civilian professionals at all ranks, who are working hard and are dedicated to the safety of our city. Thank you for your ongoing commitment during these incredibly difficult days. On October 2nd, the Toronto Police Service leadership held a planning session at the BAPS Sri Swaminarayan Mandir Temple in 23 Division. The, mid, the meeting, which had been scheduled for a number of months, was the first of many future leadership meetings to be held at different community landmarks across the city. The service has prioritized getting to know and building and maintaining positive relationships with all communities we serve as part of our commitment to supporting safer communities. This process of deepening our understanding includes being intentional about creating immersive experiences with the community for members from all ranks and areas within the service. Some of the immersive activities that we have engaged in as a service this year have included the new Recruit Community Experience Program, the Board and Chief's Pride Reception held in the community for the first time in a decade this past summer, a neighborhood community officer 
sent to observe the Longueuil Police Services Community Immersion Program, Quebec's five-week intensive immersion training program for officers, as we are looking to implement something similar here at the Toronto Police Service. The Neighbourhood Community Officer Program endeavouring to immerse its officer, officers within a community for a minimum of four years to deepen their understanding, familiarity and relationships. And the six race and identity-based collection town halls held throughout Toronto to create a forum for community members to share their perspectives and experiences as well as give feedback on our recent reports and recommended action items. These are just a few of the many ways we are engaging more deeply with the communities we serve and collectively increasing our cultural awareness and understanding. On September 30th, as part of our ongoing commitment to recognizing the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, the service paused to reflect and honor the survivors of residential schools, their families, their communities, and the countless children. <clears throat> <clears throat> who never returned home. <clears throat> Members were encouraged to wear orange shirts to show support for the survivors of the residential school system and ensure that the children who did not survive are not forgotten. In the days leading up to September 30th, the service had the distinct honor of hosting members from the Indigenous community, members of the board, and members of the Toronto Police Association at police headquarters where the Every Child Matters flag was raised to half-mast. At this special event, we listened to our community members as they provided us with valuable perspective and education, insights that we must all take forward as we commit to never forgetting this significant chapter in our country's history. Earlier this week, our service, along with the Ontario Provincial Police, announced the creation of the Provincial Carjacking Task Force. Co-led by the Toronto Police Service and the OPP, the task force is a collaboration between police services from across the Greater Toronto Area, including the York Regional Police, Halton Regional Police Service, Durham Regional Police Service and Peel Regional Police, and other external agencies, including the Criminal Intelligence Service of Ontario. The purpose of the Provincial Carjacking Task Force is to disrupt the networks responsible for high-risk auto thefts, which increasingly involve violence, firearms, and other weapons. Members of the task force will work collaboratively to maximize enforcement efforts against criminal organizations involved in violent vehicle crimes who are operating within the GTA. The Provincial Carjacking Task Force will be notified of violent auto crime occurrences taking place in each jurisdiction, which will then be investigated collaboratively by the respective service and task force team members. This joint task force is being funded by participating police services in the Criminal Intelligence Service of Ontario through funding provided by the government of Ontario. The incidence of violence relating to auto crimes occurring in Ontario has increased over the last several years. So far in 2023, there have been more than 300 carjackings in the GTA, with over 200 of those occurring right here in Toronto. Thieves are stealing vehicles and then using those vehicles to carry out other crimes or shipping them overseas where they are resold. Through this strategic partnership, police services in the GTA and throughout the province have come together in a committed effort utilizing all available resources to ensure that these criminal organizations that victimize our residents are brought to justice and that communities across the province remain safe places for all our residents. That ends my monthly remarks, uh, Chair, and at this time uh, I'm pleased to introduce Inspector Stephen Prentice from the Intelligence Service Unit who will address the Board's motion from July 27th which requested that the service, quote, explore the inclusion of specific directions in our procedures with regards to the execution of search warrants in the presence of children and vulnerable persons, including during the execution and follow-up, close quote. Stefan. Thank you, Chief. Good 
morning, Chair, members of the Board, Chief in Command. Thank you for having me here this morning to provide this update on uh, executing search warrants. Uh, this update is provided uh, <coughs> after uh, Councilor Chen, you, you uh, moved the motion in relation to children and vulnerable, vulnerable persons. And that is, uh, I can tell you, sent us off, I don't think, a very good path towards updating some additional components of our procedure that I think you'll, you'll, uh, you'll find uh, very interesting. Definitions for a uh, child, and that is meaning a person under 18 years old. We also have definitions for a vulnerable adult, which uh, means by any adult who's by nature a physical or emotional or psychological condition is dependent on other persons for care and assistance. So these are some of the most vulnerable people uh, that uh, we are talking about in this uh, part of the procedure. So we don't, I don't have the actual words for you because we still have a lot of consultation to do, but I'm giving you the spirit of, of where we are right now and the work is well underway to, to crafting this. And what it is is when children or vulnerable adults are present at a location, specific consideration must be given to uh, how we execute that search warrant using the least dynamic method of entry that we have at our disposal. And that's in balancing the need for safety and the destruction of evidence. So it, balancing those three things is, is really the key to the spirit of this, of this uh, update. A good example of that is our, our current ETF operating protocol. This has already been in, in existence for some time, but this is the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish. So members right now uh, are continuously assessing the situation right up until an entry is made. And that includes while the entry is being made itself. If they uh, find that there are, if they're planning to dis, uh, deploy something called a distractionary device or a flashbang, and they discover that there's a vulnerable person or it's just not the right time, uh, even, when, even after the, the pin is pulled and they don't have anything else that they can do, they find a way to throw that device into an area that won't impact anybody. And that happens right up to the very last second to when they're doing the entry. So this is kind of the, the, the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the assessment of risk factors, I don't know if you'll recall from our last uh, discussion, uh, is a form that just captures entry planning and risk assessment planning. And immediately after, uh, we've, we've added uh, the specific direction that when they're doing their considerations, the presence of children and vulnerable adults is considered as part of their, their assessment matrix. So I, I, in, in crafting this uh, particular bit of uh, governance, I've, I've uh, had conversations with Inspector Roger Cratchlow. He's the Toronto Police Service lead for uh, SafeTO, uh, understanding that th there's a whole component of referral that goes hand in hand with this kind of uh, this this work. So when ch children are vulnerable adults, or even where there's other circumstances <clears throat> that, in the opinion of the the supervising officer that's there, that where they deem it's, it, it would be wise to, to engage in a referral for, for somebody or for occupants, that they, they actually can uh, go ahead and make those referrals. The, the child and vulnerable adults, those are shall, like they shall make those referrals. Uh, but in other circumstances, there's some discretion for them to, you know, pick off those situations where they think it would be, it, it would be wise. So while they're on scene at that uh, search warrant, they have to solicit permission from the occupant, so they'll do that. And then... Uh, after they've done that, they'll notify. There's already an existing protocol that's been in existence with our duty senior officers and our centralized shooting response teams, where they then engage their their integrated safety coordination team lead at the station, which is either the detective sergeant or the staff sergeant in charge of the neighborhood officers. And by by engaging that, that triggers then a, a referral to uh, the community crisis response program. So then that service can come back. Uh, it, Inspector Crotchel is also engaging with his City of Toronto counterparts for us to provide co uh, proper contact information for support services that can be easily accessed directly by clients uh, themselves as opposed to waiting for referrals to get back in contact with them. Uh, it's also something that what we've done is, uh, I'll just show you our, if you'll recall our TPS 990 form, this is the form that we leave at the scene of a search warrant after we've done that. Uh, what will be added to this particular form on the front will be the reminder about offering referral services. So the members filling it out, it's a, just a trigger to remind them to offer those referrals and to seek permission. But on the back of the form is where those contacts will come from, from the city, so that it's right there uh, for the, the people if they want to access those services. And by engaging in this, in this kind of work specifically, uh, I asked Roger to, to look at SafeTO and the goals of SafeTO and see how this fits into the, the, the framework and supporting those goals. And this is what he's provided me 
that this uh, would actually touch on a number of goals that we would be supporting uh, through this important work. So what's the next step? So the next steps really is just solidifying, solidifying the actual words. We have draft language already. And then we'll be consulting with the Office of the Independent Police Review Director, the Equity, Inclusion, and Human Rights Review that will happen through our, our GERC committee, and the governance uh, that will send it broadly through the service to make sure that we're, our language is, is legal and appropriate. And then uh, it'll come to chief in command for approval. And then once that happens, I'll re-engage the people, the frontline folks, uh, detective sergeants, who are executing search warrants, and I'll, I'll in, have engagements with them to talk about all of these things in the processes, so that their, them and their mem they and their members are fully aware of what we're trying to accomplish here and how to how to accomplish that. So, subject to any questions, that's my update. I, I had a question, yeah. <laughs> Inspector Prentice, and I, I'm sure this is already the policy, but just uh, for consideration, uh, especially during search warrants, that. Um, are um, you know dynamic the type that guns and gangs do you, they're um, entering premises where their children a, a consideration for later if charges are laid that whatever's captured either on video or body warrant there is um, that ability uh, or even some kind of a directive to to edit that kind of thing because it's not really germane to the investigation if there's young children or a vulnerable adult so um, that was just something I was thinking of. I think you do it already, but just very mindful of that particular group because uh, you will capture uh, children on videos and uh, the body warrants. Yeah, certainly, and I, I think there's a, a working group right now on disclosure that uh, I think James Cornish is working on that or the, the CIO, I don't know if. Yeah, Thank so, you. Uh, so the, uh, the disclosure, there is a working group between us, ourselves, and, um, and the MAG. Um, and uh, we are working on um, on um, making it both easier, more automated, but um, also making sure we have a standard um, where everyone is adapting the same standard as to what needs to be redacted for the protection of the public. Thank you, Deputy Steers. Councillor Chang has a question. Actually, it's uh, more of a comment. I'm really grateful for this thoughtful work that has been invested, and um, it makes me think about the child that I met that inspired me to, to share this uh, and make that motion. Um, and it came out of a basketball game that I hosted between um, youth in a vulnerable community and a police division uh, many, many years ago. And that honest conversation that can come when we build positive relationships. So, um, you know, just thanking that youth who courageously shared how they were impacted by being a child in a house that was going through a search. Um, but then um, how it's now, you know, years later rippled into this. And just, I'm so grateful to know that when a police officer is going through their um, search warrant process that, you know, now there's a visibility to the presence of these young people and, the, and mitigating the impacts uh, in order to hopefully foster trust and a positive relationship in the long run. So really grateful for this work and I look forward to the final language. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, um, if there's not any more questions, thanks for um, Inspector Prentice and as well, uh, Chief, for your very uh, uh, thoughtful update. Uh, I know I've seen even the command post in my own neighborhood and. I can't tell you how much it means to, to neighbors um, that the police have responded and shown their presence and love and support and offer for protection. And I know from just in my own community, people feel um, safe and they feel validated. So I, I really applaud the um, service for not only um, what they're doing in the community right now, uh, but also um, how quickly you mobilized uh, uh, to do this and to amass the resources, carefully focus on where they needed, carefully deciding, uh, you know, um, where um, we needed to um, establish zones where people were, compl you know, particularly feeling aggrieved or frightened. So I just, on behalf of the board, want to thank you, especially for the quick mobilization. All right, may I have a motion to receive both the presentation and the chief's update? <laughs> um, Lisa, and seconded by Councillor Chang. All in favor? 
Thank you. Uh, and the next uh, matter is a uh, relating to the confirmation of the minutes of our last public uh, board meeting on September 14, 2023. Mr. Zelmo, I believe you're here to make a deputation. <laughs> so there's no point for me to talk much. I'll just uh, say okay. five points. Tur turn your mic on, please, Mr. Zomo, so we can it. hear you. I'll just, uh, what? What should I there, press? There's a button. Can you hear me? Yes. So there's no, no need for a button. I'll just uh, read five points that I wrote down through an experience of the last uh, three years. So quickly, I think I've got five minutes, right? So I think I'll be able to fill it. So then uh, where I used to live right here in a condo, then I got evicted because I got a divorce and I couldn't think about things like work. So then after a certain amount of months, the attorney general's office kicked me out of my house, right? And my girlfriend is who I'm supposed to meet at 10, so I'm glad I got to talk now. They were still together, right? So her and I ended up on living in our car. So then we lived in our car for now. I'm from Toronto. I grew up in Toronto, right? So, but in the pandemic situation, it didn't feel like I could be honest with myself at the pace that people were trying to demand me, even my own family. So I couldn't, let's say, even stay in my folks' place. So I, I stayed in my car. So for about a year here in, here in the streets of Toronto. So um, for the first month, we uh, I, I almost got sick because we we're basically walking on the street without shoes. So then I started showering at the Timmy's at King Sudbury. But then in my mind, you guys were looking for a new chief back then. So I thought, at least I'll, while I'm out here, I'll, I'm an educator. I have experience in education. So I figured while I'm out here, and she's a nurse, right? I could at least achieve something like becoming the next chief of police, right? So then with that setting, I spent my time on the street. Obviously, I felt vulnerable, right? Because there's a lot of prejudice. For example, if you're looking a certain way and trying to get, a, get inside a building when there's a cl clear protocol written, exceptions apply. So that is, what does it take to, you, that is, I couldn't survive the exception and it's written on the door of every building in the city, right? So that is, I fought for the exception, right? So then I died for it actually because I couldn't survive the exception that is. You can't make me without my consent. I fought for that. So here, here's my conclusion. I, I do appreciate MCIT. I think that's the, that's the proof that innovation occurred in this organization. And you, you should be proud of that. Um, but this person, I saw this person's picture who supposedly killed themselves. This is not the first person in the Toronto police history who killed themselves. I think there's a history in Wikipedia on it. Hong Kong-based chief of police here in the city of Toronto who killed himself trying to amalgamate all the divisions. Now, when I tried to become chief, then I thought, why did he die to try to amalgamate the division? Well, I realized there's maybe some politics going on, but actually we're trying to assert manhood in a safe way, right? It's somebody's trying to enter somebody's house, right? So not to die, right? He has a home to go get back to. And maybe that person whose home is being bro broken into is unaware of how to deal with it. Pa Paquette is an example where there's no room in the apartment for a cop to enter because then she has to, then that's, that's probably why she fell out of the balcony. It's because there was no room for the cop to enter. So I fight for that safety. That's what I fight for. The freedom of movement, physically, psychologically, and spiritually. So sometimes, um, so I, I once got arrested for yelling at a guy on the bus. I didn't physically touch him, but I yelled at him like his father. So I affected him. Although not physically, you couldn't see the physical because there was no physical, but I yelled at him like his father. So it's, I hope the justice system can accommodate as quickly as possible without delay to that, to the, to the, high, to the higher truthfulness of, the, of every situation so that people won't have to experience the prejudice because me personally, it feels a certain way to be accused, right? And it's not like uh, the system is rushing towards me, right, to help me, right? So... I'll, I'll just make my five points and I'll finish then. I think I'm good on time. You have, you have a minute, Mr. Zelma. Oh, great. So, so I'll just pull up the picture if I may. So, so number one, safety and benefit that is the police as a, as a, as a, as a social organization 
safety and benefit procurement, which you're, you're procuring safety and benefit in a goodwill organization, is useful for agent protection. That is, as long as you see yourself as not a profit-making, budget-fitting budget organization, you're actually trying to protect social order and safety on all levels for every person, right? So you're supposed to think of yourself as a benefit organization. So then, and also some people who may work undercover, they may feel vulnerable, more vulnerable than they should. One, one, one officer may, may think he needs to execute a search warrant, but he's nervous about, well, he doesn't want to overstep, but what if it's a serious situation, he needs 10 cops, but he doesn't, need, he doesn't feel comfortable overstepping that. Maybe he never requested 10 cops, right? Maybe well, that's what he needs. Number two, investing extra in difficult areas is neither policing nor industry. Three, is the policeman free from ourselves? Is the policeman free of the situation? For case management, is, um, is case management non interference, non interference towards the urgency of knowledge to safety. That is, the system cannot at any moment, in any way, interfere with my ability to attain safety. And number five is um, the potential of self representation. That is, of course, I called my uh, ex-fiance's father, who's this uh, big Jewish lawyer, right? I called him because, of course, I'm, I can't afford his fees. But in the end, in the end, I experienced the full prejudice of self-representation, which is at every point you're supposed to be able to learn for yourself and hopefully people help you along the way. The duty council, the case management office, a cop here and there, people along the way to help you get to freedom. So thank you for your time. Thank I realize you. being here, it's a very serious organization, and I realize there's also a national and an international aspect to the media aspect of it, but I think it's important to say that you should all understand that the people do not understand that it's a privilege that all these uh, high-level security or social security professionals are sitting here available for public view. I think that people do not appreciate that, that it's a privilege that, you can, that the, the, the community can see all of you here. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to, especially Chief, you shouldn't have to be here. That's, what, that's the point. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. May I have a motion then to uh, receive the confirmation of the minutes? Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Morley and uh, uh, Nick, uh, Nick Migliori, all in favor? Thank you. Uh, the next item is um, item two. It's the budget committee update. We have um, uh, two uh, deputations. Just I will first acknowledge Mr. Albert Wenzel uh, uh, wrote in a written deputation. Thank you. And we have Miguel who wishes to make a deputation. Yeah. First, I want to thank uh, for the opportunity to bring my coffee from <laughs> outside. I didn't, I didn't get it stopped this time, but this is good news. So this is for you, base information from Councilor Morley, Chen, and, and Burnside. This is, this is not a, a bomb. This is not something that you should be afraid. A city council chambers, you know, uh, we are not even allowed to have water. So, you know, come on, you, know, you need to make some changes. Because for the last eight years, when uh, Mayor Tory was mayor, uh, there were so, so many um, things that done to confront violence. But what violence? Um, from Miguel, from <laughs> Chris, or from Derek? We're not violent people. We just have a voice, an opinion. Some of you may not like it, but it's fine. So I'm here to talk on the update on the on the city by on the Toronto budget, police budget. So we need to choose out of the three councillors or someone else to represent at these uh, meetings, which uh, one of them has been cancelled because you had to find somebody to sit at that, that committee. So I had to, you had to make a choice. Um, if you ask me, Miguel, who you, would you recommend? Um, I would like to recommend Councillor Morley to sit at the council at uh, this budget committee because or her living experience, her knowledge. Um, she, she's a young person. She knows what uh, young people out there are facing. Nothing against Councillor Lily Chen. I know she's doing great. Uh, 
but you know this will be a very important role to fulfill and also you may become a member uh, enemy of the police union who knows but I'm, I'm telling you that the, that may happen and in regards to Councilor Bronsai, I'm really disappointed by your performance at Lampard Stadium, which I, I was there, and you know I was there too. So I want to recommend Councilor Bronsai for that position. Um, so that is my deputation, and um, I hope you guys make the right choice because, you know, people are struggling to find a place to live in this city. It's so expensive. Um, Refugees are keep coming. Um, Olivia Chow, Mayor Olivia Chow is doing her best to uh, knock on the doors of uh, Queens Park, uh, Ottawa, finding money. And this budget, you know, is um, perhaps uh, something that uh, you should upload it to the province. Uh, here's me again on August the 25th uh, at Executive Committee, and the Toronto Sun took my picture. He called me. A, he called me a loony, but it's fine. I'm I'm okay with that. <laughs> loony ideas are always uh, ideas that ch they can change society out of the box. Ideas. Let me put it that way. So, one of the things I advise uh, Mayor Olivia Chow it was to um, upload the operating budget of the Toronto Police because. Whatever we have done in the last 13 years as a regular deputy at this board has been little, less than 1% or not even 10% uh, reduction. We went through the core service review when Mayor uh, Raffle was in, in, and he tried, his, uh, he didn't try enough. Uh, John Tory did try at the beginning to reduce the budget to 10%. But that didn't happen. Before he left, <laughs> he um, he said that uh, you guys own union um, condition uh, obligations with the with the collective agreement, and you need to increase the budget. See, this is 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 really um, a, a a point to make a balance in in view of the continual uh, people living on the encampments and city streets, and it is. Um, Inimaginable what's, what's, what's going on out there. I, I, I see this every day when I go around in my bicycle in Ward 13. People are desperate. Uh, the cases of mental health are over the limit. Um, it's, it's inimaginable. How are we going to find a solution? Well, the solution is very clear poverty is the roots of violence. Poverty, poverty, poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. All right, so at, at this point, um, just, just a very brief discussion. Um, uh, uh, Doobie Canagister sent out uh, an email uh, canvassing, uh, you know, interest as uh, Councillor Crisanti had, uh, um, is no longer on the police services board. Uh, I think everyone had an opportunity to weigh in. So just, so just, and correct me if I'm wrong. And before I move, uh, that the board uh, appoint someone, um, my own discussions, and as well, uh, Dr. Canningisser's discussion. I understand amongst the city councilor that um, you you talked about it and that you decided that you wanted Councilor Chang to represent. Is that am I? Is that fair? Okay. All right. Well, then, uh, given that that was the discussion. Um, I move that the board appoint uh, Councillor Lily Chang to fill the vacancy on the board's budget uh, committee, and the next meeting is November uh, 27th, and I believe it's at 10 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, um, <coughs> yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Take it. Thank you. And um, <coughs> so, at this point. Um, I also move to uh, receive the, the board report from Dr. Kangisser. Thank you. Um, Lisa and Amber, thank you. And now moving to item number three. Um, this is as it relates to the report from Doobie Kangisser as to the revived uh, board policy and the board member training. Uh, just firstly, before Derek comes up to um, 
uh, give his um, deputation. John Sewell gave a written deputation, and we want to thank uh, Mr. Sewell for it. Derek, I understand you did a written one, and you will be speaking as well in person on this matter. Thank you. I just want to say by me speaking at this meeting, this shall not be deemed to be in any way my consent expressed or implied in doing so as fraud. God bless His Majesty the King and long live His Majesty the King. And if Miguel has ever led the Toronto Police to believe in any way that he is the surety for the person he has, then that would be a mistake and that I ask the Toronto Police to please forgive Miguel. So in this report it mentions, notably this anticipates in part requirements included in the Community Safety and Policing Act Section 35, which is yet to come into force. I don't think people realize Kathleen Wynne was like that close to passing this new Police Services Act. But yeah, I know. That was like over five years ago. I mean, I think I just found out there's a reporter here from the Toronto Star. And I think it'd be a great story if she were to approach Premier Ford and said like, what's your problem? <laughs> like, I. I can't very well come here and go off on public appointments for how long it took five months to replace Jim Hart on this board. Five years? Like, what's Premier Ford being? Okay, well, actually, I don't know what he's been doing, but like, I suppose he'd have to actually stay in the legislature long enough to get the new Police Service Act passed, right? So, um, when you, this is very much a doobie item, and I remember when you introduced him as the new executive director that you, uh, I think you said that he has a commitment to uh, evidence-based decision-making. Uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Morley actually mentioned the same thing at the Board of Health. Um, and uh, recently at City Council last week, uh, Councillor Chen quite cynically called out the posers, I'm paraphrasing what she said, at the City Council, who talk a good game about evidence-based decision-making, but their actions uh, show otherwise. So I expect um, Toronto Police Service Board members to make evidence-based decision-making based on the letter of the law, which ironically, again, was mentioned by Premier Ford recently when he was asked to comment on the uh, RCMP investigation into his government. He said, bring it on. I want to make sure that the letter of the law was followed. And um, the councillors here know that last week at City Council, there was an integrity commissioner report that dealt with uh, the previous mayor's um, <clears throat> work daughter or something like that, in which uh, they covered, there's a number of codes of conduct at the city of Toronto where they're all told that uh, the letter of the law shall be followed. And I know from experience, there's a, actually a decent, someone who works at the Ontario Civilian Police Commission, Larissa Schiara, who's told me by email that yes, they expect the Toronto Police Service and the board here to follow the letter of the law. I also wonder how our new Inspector General of Policing and the Solicitor General uh, feel about this um, uh, subject. So I just wanted to let Doobie know what it says in Barrick Gold Corporation versus Ontario 2000 where the Court of Appeal for Ontario said that municipalities must, however, do more than confirm, conform with the strict letter of the law in order to remain within the boundaries of their law-making powers. And in Black's Law Dictionary, 9th edition, letter of the law is defined as the strictly literal meaning of the law rather than the intention or policy behind it. Uh, in Metropolitan Toronto Police Services Board versus the Metropolitan Toronto Police Association, 1992, the Court of Appeal for Ontario said, the interesting contradiction is that the association insists on the letter of the law being followed when that is in its interest. The officers are within their legal rights in insisting on the letter of the law. So you all have the right, entitled to the right, have the letter of the law followed. I think if the law applies to everyone equally, that should also go for the public. Uh, another thing, can we get like a proper, can we get a definition for what a, a proper definition for what a bylaw is in the bylaws uh, definition section here? Like bylaw means a bylaw. Eh, I think we all learned in grade school that as a rule of thumb, you don't really use a, a definition to define the word that you're defining. Just uh, throw one out there uh, from Bouvier's Law Dictionary. Bylaws is defined as rules and ordinances made by a corporation for its own government. And also, this is very important, 
Uh, I don't know if Deputy Mayor Morley's had a chance to look at the bylaw definition section, but there is no definition for point of privilege. I've come to find out that um, she recently schooled the uh, deputy speaker and the speaker at Toronto City Council. You're not going to believe this. Like she was pretty much verbally attacked, if not defamed, and by this like insane council member who just gets to blurt anything that comes out of their mouth and get away with it. Nobody calls that out, but I just want to thank Deputy Mayor Morley for uh, schooling that particular council member and putting them in their place. Thank you, Derek. And I now have a uh, motion to uh, approve report uh, item number three, the revised board policy. All right, Councillor Chang. <laughs> thank you. Um, I noted that, uh, first of all, thank you for the report. And uh, obviously, I know it's such a hard time to train all of us board members because we're so busy and just scheduling alone is a mountain. Um, I noted that in the police training report, it talks about a third party oversight. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, um, are there any opportunities for us to include jurisdictional scans and third party oversight into our board training to ensure that you know, we have the best board training, um, I guess, govern uh, policies to, to make us a, a good and strong board? Uh, we can look into that. I can say that we're working with the OAPSB as well as CAPG on developing various trainings. I know the OAPSB is very much involved right now in developing trainings for all boards. And as the report mentions, this comes in part from the CSPA, uh, which itself is not very clear. It's kind of vague about what sorts of trainings are expected for board members. Um, so I, I'm in communication with the OAPSB, with other uh, uh, board offices across Ontario, so we compare notes mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. we try our best to, to provide the best uh, uh, trainings that we have. Great. It's such a monumental task, I know, and for board members, we're so new, especially many of us here are quite new, to a monumental organization that this piece uh, is important and we have to wrestle through it, especially with scheduling is probably one of the biggest challenges, but we really want to make sure we have a good foundation. So thank you Absolutely. for your and this work. Absolutely, and this is a new process for us, and yes. we're going to learn and mm -hmm. do evidence-based uh, development of this as we go along so that we can improve it, and we'll be constantly in contact with the board members to make sure that you're getting what you need. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Chang. Um, may I have a motion to approve? <laughs> um, Councillor Chang, <laughs> um, Deputy Mayor Morley, Thank you all in favor. Uh, receive uh, item number three. Item number four is a uh, report from the Chief, the annual report on police training 2022. Um, I believe, uh, Mr. Moran, um, you first have a in-person um, deputation to make, followed by Mr. Langenfeld after that, who's here with us virtually. <laughs> um, again, Chair Morgan, my mom called me Derek. So in this report, it says the TPS ensures that its members receive quality training, foster continuous professional development, and hold values of equity, inclusion, human rights, and belonging. Because the City of Toronto loves going on and on about how they look at everything through an equity lens, the truth is I don't think anyone really at the City of Toronto knows what that word means. So in Cohen versus a state of Cohen, Cohen versus the estate of Cohen, 2021, the Superior Court of Justice said that equity refers to those principles that were initially created in the English High Court of Chancery, which were developed in response to the rigid technical procedures of the common law. Equity might be described as softening or correcting the common law. In my view, these equitable principles were imported into Section 56.4 of the Family Law Act. Um, so in this report, it also says... It is important to note that due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the TPC had to continually adapt its training methods to minimize virus transmission. Hopefully this place is done with coercing its members into taking an experimental gene therapy product in order to keep their job. So new recruits in the future should be taught what the Supreme Court of New York said in the George Garvey case that being vaccinated 
does not prevent an individual from contracting or transmitting COVID-19. Because since last month's TPS, uh, the last meeting, a TPS member uh, I spoke to wh who was aware of who I am, and um, we got to talking, and they profusely thanked me for speaking about how nobody here at the board wants to talk about what Joe Warmington has written about twice, how Toronto Police Service members have experienced COVID vaccine injuries from those d dangerous experimental uh, gene therapy shots. So I looked at what I had to say about this uh, item last year, and instead of going on and on about uh, common law, surety of the person, section 32.1, I thought it would be better if in the future Toronto Police Service members were trained from the get-go on what their rights were in regards to being coerced and to taking a mandatory vaccination. So this is from Duplessis versus Canada, 2000. The Federal Court of Canada said in the standing court martial of ex-Sergeant Kipling, the chief military judge found that the forced vaccination program did violate Section 7 of the Charter and that the accused's right to life, liberty, and security of the person was infringed. Non-consensual vaccination under the threat of disciplinary proceedings amounts to an invasion of the bodily integrity and personal autonomy of a person. In Lapierre versus AG of Quebec, 1985, the Supreme Court of Canada said, the unavoidable risk of an accident resulting in death or serious injury, which is occasioned by a compulsory vaccination, has only been an undisputed scientific fact for a short time, and though very rare, this risk is still proportionately not widely known. This is from Blake versus University Health Network, 2021, Superior Court of Justice. The very object of a mandatory vaccine policy is to compel employees subject to the policy to receive the vaccine. An arbitrator can reinstate an employee terminated for failing to yield before such a policy if it is ultimately found to be unreasonable or otherwise contrary to the collective agreement. However, no remedy exists to undo a vaccine since administered. This policy in question and this vaccine are both relatively new and their application in the collective bargaining context is yet to be settled. Because I've heard recently that the whole contract with the Toronto Police and collective bargaining is coming up. I mean, if I'm a Toronto Police Service member, there is no way in hell I'm letting the union sign that any agreement unless it specifically says in the future, I am not being forced to take something that was never used as a so-called vaccine before COVID came along with a 99.86% survival rate, which I've said at the Board of Health before, and they have completely ignored. So they don't care about that. Just take the vaccine because, uh, you know, I'm kind of getting tired of going to uh, like audit committee. I brought up about, uh, you know, what about uh, Diverge Media's reporting on uh, Dr. Davila's husband having received money from COVID vaccine makers, and I get crapped on by my own counselor in my own area, Mike Cole, which was kind of embarrassing. But you know what? I'll just keep plowing forward because that's my freedom of expression. I'll just uh, keep invoking and uh, exercising. Thank you, Derek. And I believe, do we have uh, Mr. Langenfeld online? Uh, he also had a deputation. Hi, good morning, uh, Chair Morgan. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, the, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, mention here um, on the uh, thank you for putting on your website that the walk-on items were coming. Um, I'd like to suggest that those also be included in a news release, uh, which automatically then gets emailed to all the people because I didn't see it until I was actually uh, signing up to make my deputation there at the last minute. Um, in terms of this item here on the uh, the police training, um, I just noticed in Appendix A here that it lists the uh, recommendations from the um, police board's 81 recommendations. And uh, I would like to mention that those 81 recommendations, in fact, come from... Um, from the, the beginning of COVID when uh, these recommendations were made by uh, staff and uh, 
members of the board were not sure which. There was no public consultation about any of them, and all of a sudden we came up with these 81 recommendations, um, some of which are questionable. But uh, anyways, on this uh, Appendix A here for the training, it refers uh, to Recommendation 56, which was to direct the police of chief, the chief of police to report the feasibility of all uniformed service members receiving MCIT training or other mental health crisis response training, such as mental health first aid or emotional CPR. And unfortunately, they've included that recommendation in here, but nowhere in the report does it make any mention of um, any kind of response to these recommendations and whether or not any of them have been implemented. Uh, in trying to search a little further, I found that uh, it mentioned somewhere else that there was another report some at some other uh, time previous that went to the board regarding this, but no sort of indication of what the bo- what the report actually said, other than the fact that they weren't going to do this MCI tre- t- uh, training for all staff, and that uh, that people should refer to this other report that I couldn't find. So I'd like to suggest that first of all, in these reports, um, if you're going to refer to recommendations or anything like that. I hope that we can also try and include in the report what the actual summary of the uh, the response was to the recommendations from years ago. And I'm wondering, in particular in this case, uh, what is the current uh, status of uh, police training, uh, giving MCIT training to all of the police staff, or at least... Uh, some version of MCIT uh, training and crisis response training. Uh, what are we doing uh, in regards to that for the rest of the service? I see the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Langenfeld. And I may let uh, Deputy uh, uh, Dolly well uh, answer that um, um, it, uh, and just uh, talk to you a little bit about the MCIT training because you're right it isn't necessarily an intensive course for everyone because it tends to be a specialty but I'll let uh, Deputy Dolly well t- uh, talk a little bit more where you can find the information that you need. <laughs> so we did look at the feasibility of um, the MCI tree training, I believe we we actually looked at it last year. We just for completeness added all of the recommendations here, even though some of these we would have addressed in, in the last year or two. So the MCI tree training is quite intense. Um, it's, it's designed to be delivered, um, assuming you have a partner with uh, in a nurse. And so rather than that, what we the, what the service embarked on was this idea of a divisional crisis support officer so that there is at least a, a couple officers per division that have enhanced mental health training with a goal of having coverage um, with staffing the way it is. It's not necessarily 24-hour coverage all the time, but that is the uh, goal and the endeavor to have gotten that kind of coverage. So we do have a cadre of officers that have more than just the basic officer training, but the other area where we incorporate mental health training is in our annual ISTP, which is our in-service training, uh, three days of training as a refresher, and the um, the examples, the simulations that they go through, those are updated every year, and there are always a few of them that actually relate to mental health. And just for relative ease of finding it, uh, for someone who has gone on the dashboard, sees the recommendations, where could they find sort of the, the, this updated assessment and the information? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I know that we do, um, through strategy management, have a public dashboard on the status of every recommendation, but I'll, I'll have to follow up and actually see if then our conclusions are also included in there or if it's just a red, yellow, green, but certainly through the board we'll, we can get back to you on that. Thank you, Deputy Dalawell, and thank you, Mr. Langenfeld. Thank um, and uh, thank you. Uh, if you... I may, if I, if I might just um, so I, I did actually look on the uh, the um, board, dashboards there, and and I found some information. But of course, you go searching and you spend a lot of time looking, but you don't actually find the answer. You just find that somewhere else there is a, a reference there. But I'd like to point out that this. 
Um, you look at the recommendation, and that is the problem with uh, coming up with these kind of 81 recommendations with no public input. The fact is that the recommendation which the board approved was for all, or at least to look at the feasibility of having all mm -hmm. uniformed service members receive MCIT training had there been proper consultation back when uh, Jim Hart and others were coming up with these recommendations. Uh, we might have the, the board might have approved um, the idea of how many people should actually be getting this training. I think the idea was that all officers would have uh, enhanced training, and, and it sounds like we're not at that stage yet. So maybe the problem is with the recommendation, and you need to look at what recommendations you're making. Thank you. And thank you for raising that, and we'll, um, we'll follow up with that uh, in terms of uh, what the conclusions are and, as you pointed out, what are the next steps. So thank you. Um, may I have a motion to um, receive uh, item number four, please? Questions? Oh, Ms. Chang. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for this report. It's very insightful to understand more about the training. Um, I'm just wondering this list that we see here of all these courses, does it cover the basic training in the six months or is this all the training that happens in addition to the six months? This, this is really over and above the basic constable training. Um, and it says here that you know a lot of effort is made with co consultative committees um, and stakeholders to speak into the training. And I wonder, when we consult these mem members and stakeholders, do they then get a chance to participate and observe the training in action and then give feedback? Over the years, yes, we, we do have sort of a, a standing community advisory panel that actually gets to see everything, but over the last few years, we've also invited many people to spend sort of a concentrated day at the college to review whether that's ARAP, PACER, the OHRC, as well as our community advisory groups. And are we able to see um, a summary of some of the feedback that's been provided in the past based on their observations? Absolutely, we do have a running list of some of the recommendations that have been made on in certain um, for some of our curriculums. Yes. Great. Um, and I noted here. I think it's great that you are doing the follow-up feedback, and I noted that an increased participation in giving feedback because of um, how it's you know you're using the phone and doing it during the training. And I'm just wondering. Um, this feedback about uh, centering black experience in particular, has, is there a, a special data collection for black members of the force who go through the training? Um, because their insight um, and perspective on this training might be different and valuable to um, collect separately just for that additional layer. Is that something that... So at this time, that's not... Right now, it's anyone in the class is mm -hmm. filling it. It's sort of one evaluation. It's certainly something we can take away, but we, we do not at this point in time have any sort of plan or, or way of kind of segregating based on sociodemographic data. Mm -hmm. it, it might be helpful just mm -hmm. because they are, you know, participating in something that they are also... Um, participatory too and you know in addition to that just taking this feedback um, having it also be segregated by years of service might also be helpful because knowing how people in their different stages of their career are being impacted by the training so I think it's a good start and it's good that it's easy to do um, and then just strengthening some of the data sets to uh, be able to understand the effectiveness and, um, you know, how it affects different people at different stages of their career development. Uh, the other piece that I wanted to just touch on is the IPV training, Interpartment Partner Violence. As you know, we declared it an epidemic and um, I see that 96 officers went through the training. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, this is in addition to the basic training that um, already happens in the six months, is that correct? 
Correct. This is uh, a specialized course, so it's not delivered necessarily to everyone, and it is over and above any of the theory and simulations that would be delivered in ISTP or in the basic constable training. We also have we also cover a lot of the IPV concepts in our general investigative course. I think at the last month I provided a more fulsome response on all the partners that actually weigh in on some of our curriculum and content in this area across our many courses. So in our training for IPV, um, so this, this training was more specific to investigations, right? But um, in general, systems and supports are constantly evolving. And is anyone tasked with monitoring what the system is and what the supports are so that all officers are equipped with timely information because I think, you know, a lot of officers are the first people that, uh, you know, victims of I IPV would uh, encounter. And so just wondering if there is a piece where there's somebody monitoring, because in the past I've heard where some, you know, anecdotally, officer may not know about current shelter capacity or mm -hmm. when it, the shelters are full, what other options are available. And so it seems to me that that timeliness of knowing what is available right now is really important for officers to have that on hand. So that's, um, that's more of the day-to-day -day sort of knowledge. We don't have a full-time FTE that's just monitoring that, but we have a very close relationship with our victim services arm, in addition to um, very open collaboration with Meg and Children's Aid to make sure that our content and our curriculum is up to date. But from a day-to-day -day capacity standpoint, we, we certainly lean on the experts at victim services to, to know some of these things in the moment for sure. Can I just add to that? Uh, you, we've had presentations here from victim services and their continued engagement and uh, deployment of victim services support into our divisions. Uh, so that is something that is continuing to evolve. Um, so we will have greater access to victim service people in our workplaces in our divisions, but I really want to put a fine point on this. Um, every police officer in Toronto has a phone number for victim services. They are a, a significant contributor to our capacity to provide the kinds of supports people need in the greatest time of need. And uh, we are very much reliant on victim services in that regard. And there's not a question in my mind that every police officer who is operationally deployed in this city understands the need to contact victim services, as well as all the investigators who take on these cases and supervisors. Thank you, Chief. I, I want to just uh, sure. ask Can something of the Chief or make a, a comment. I take it as well as initial training, because um, Councillor Chang's question was about making sure there's adequate resources and there can be immediate choices to assist with victims. I take it that each division, uh, depending on the demography of that division, um, the various cultural sensibilities of that division, also has their own roster and relationships that they assist folks that are appropriate to that particular community and those community needs. So I take it that that's another layer, but that, that's, that's responding at the local level who, who know their own community and what, if any, uh, things uh, are available to folks in that community. Yeah, Chair, thank you so much, because I think that's an important point as well to recognize. And, and we see the power of that through our neighborhood community officers who are on the ground and for fostering the relationships, not just in the community, but with the support entities that you know work and reside within the communities they serve. Um, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of focus. And our incredible, uh, frankly, leadership of this organization in driving focus across the city. It is the Toronto Police that has been a significant leader in that space since the envisioning of focus and continues to be. And that is something that every divisional um, uh, commander and infrastructure is familiar with. Can I, can I also just add in point of order, sorry. <laughs> It's on this topic when we talked about, I was going to speak to the focus tables too, and, and within the focus tables and being part of the, we call ourselves the founders of the Rexdale one when we first, first inception, um, 
and this, you know, deeming something an epidemic and that, and we know that intimate violence has been going on for decades and decades and decades, and, and how far advanced it has come along with the, the services that are out there it doesn't necessarily mean because our populations change in our communities that everyone is aware of those services or how to navigate them. But the, the police part, and obviously the uh, TPS was, was the initiated and brought in the partners of the City of Toronto and United Way for the focus tables. Um, and TCHC was a huge part at the beginning as well, and the other stakeholders and the services that are offered within those communities. So officers do have in all the catchment areas throughout Toronto, in, in the back of their books and whatnot too, is all of that information that the referral process happens on the spot at that time, and they can put in the call. We've had officers that actually come to our agencies and bring clients to the agencies, which is phenomenal to see as well uh, within the various divisions. So. Uh, there, I think it's just getting the public message out there as to what those um, systems of navigation are for our communities, and perhaps we should be speaking also offline and making it part of these that have those presentations where it's known to the public, but also through councillors and through the city in those partnerships of the other organizations that are outside of that and out of the city uh, funded ones even that provide those services and supports that are really necessary in that grassroots, especially for intimate violence, where people don't want everyone to know or large or even organizations because of that confidentiality and the fear and the embarrassment, et cetera, and the other stigma that is attached to it. So uh, to the chief's point too and to the chairs, there are services that are out there that the police are aware of that they, they help people navigate that system. They aren't necessarily the ones that are going to take them in the system in taking them on as cases. Uh, and moving on is those services are out there. That's where the more intense expertise lies, and they are aware to do those referrals. There's lots of referrals that happen on a daily basis. I think for myself, just anecdotally, having mm -hmm. been in situations where um, officer did not necessarily refer and would say the shelters are full and then there's nothing else offered. So um, mm -hmm. that would just be concerning to me that, you know, do all officers know what the shelter capacities are at this moment in time? Is there like a regular briefing that can happen? Like, could we send out a, a memo on a bi-weekly or basis? Like, right now, here's what happens when someone calls 211311 because in a moment of crisis, they are trying to look for where can I go? And if we know there's you know, and do they know that if the shelter system is full in Toronto, they could actually go to another shelter in another jurisdiction? These are things that just providing options for people who are at a very critical moment, right? Yeah. Councillor, um, <laughs> after you, uh, Member Kostakis, Councillor Burnside wanted to make a comment. Just, just to discuss the reality of that, the, the actual, not just capacity, and I, I'll let the chief speak to the police capacity piece, but even for the services, the nonprofit sector, because shelters and the, the referrals are from various agencies, on an hour to hour and a minute to minute basis, the capacity of shelters, there is no possible way that even the, the organizations who serve the community could know 100% at all times what that capacity is never mind that being the police's responsibility as well, unless there's a special unit of some kind. So I'm just gonna to speak to the reality of uh, not just capacity, but how the system works where anyone can either at times show up by themselves with their suitcases, which happens in, within our agencies, but also within some of the shelters, and also minute by minute, how many agencies are actually doing referrals. So that's, that's really, really difficult. And I'll let the chief speak to the police capacity piece. No, I think, listen, I think, um, I think there's some important points being made here, but I, I, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, I think the city has a very important role to play here. Mm. Every police officer in the city of Toronto is not going to be capable to address every city resource and the availability of it. So I think there's a bigger discussion to have around the role of the city to provide information to its residents on all the supports that are available and as they shift and change. So I think we you know, will do everything we can to advise our officers locally through all their engagement. But I think it's you know, important to, to also think about the role the city has to play in the city agencies to create that awareness in our communities on what's available. And, and if there's strains on those resources, what they are and how to resource them. Thank you, Councillor Burnside, you had a question or a comment? Uh, actually, I have both. So in terms of my comment, um, to sort of back up what has already been said, uh, by a fellow board member, I was actually on, in the encampment office at the city, 
And um, one of the big frustrations, like, our people were right on the front line in encampments. I understand this is a bigger homeless and shelter issue, but we couldn't get up-to-date information. Yeah. We were told to call whatever the number was and wait in line. Like, we had people trying to help them get out of tents, out of parks, and we had to wait for, like, it was often more than an hour. So, so that's the first point I want to make. Secondly, I'm very cautious, or I'd like to be very cautious of shifting these burdens back onto the police. Um, the budget is what it is, and we know with all the, all the constraints. And to me, it's uh, maybe our job to talk to the city. Um, we're the ones providing the service. We should be providing the information as opposed to asking the police to always call and, and you know, Anytime we request anyone, whether it's the city for a report or the police to make a call, we're just adding to their, to their workload. And I'd rather have them do the things that they're best at doing and which they're highly trained to do. So I think there's a resource allocation there. But um, now my question is, how many days do we actually spend um, our police officers trained on an annual basis, like retraining, whether it's use of force, whether it's sensitivity training? What's the total number of days for a regular police constable? So the minimum is going to be their in-service training, which is three. Oh, right. this is beyond um, the six months they spend as a cadet. But the reality is that's the floor. There's actually lots, if you'll look at the summary, of how many other days that there are. Um, but it would vary. I'll have to get you the kind yeah. of general average. Um, no matter what everyone's required to do in service, then on top of that, if they're in a specialized unit, they have to get retrained. I'm not talking about specialized. I'm just really talking. I'm trying to get a handle on what the how many days a police con a regular piece police constable, not from a special unit, just out in the yeah. car, um, is spent. Uh, how many how many days a year they actually spend? out of the car in training? The bare minimum will be the three days, which is your in-service training to get refresher training for those three days. So just, I want to level set, because we use the term use of force training. Yeah. So I want to make sure we're clear. In-service training now includes use of force. So that's within that three days, they do their annual requalification on their force options, and then two additional days of um, different elements of training that are mandated, whether through board directions or other, um, other priorities that we've identified for our officers to be topically and timely trained on. Yeah, yeah I'm talking about the big picture. Yeah, okay. so they'll the do, um, in those three days, they'll do equity-related training. There's re a resiliency component, active bystander training. They will do the latest set of updated scenarios in our simulator, plus use of force qualification. Okay. There will be other mandatory online training, but I wouldn't kind of, those are hours, not days. Okay, thank you. Deputy Morley, did you have a question? Uh, just a quick comment um, to pick you, piggyback off of my colleague, Councillor Burnside, and um, the comments from the Chief as well. I think it's really important for us to understand, you know, the, all the roles that we play as a team, right? Mm -hmm. Team Toronto, the police is a critical part of keeping our community safe. Um, but we heard from our deputants earlier about things like poverty being the root of violence. We know that that's, that is the case. Um, so the city does have an important role to play. And as was mentioned earlier as well, um, the Safe TO initiative is a really important one uh, that helps us to break down the silos and to really center wellness, center vulnerable communities and how we care for them um, in more coordinated ways. And so I know the mayor's office is, um, someone's listening in, uh, you know, and they're always paying attention to this important work. Uh, and I think it's something that my colleagues and I at the city can certainly take back because um, it isn't reasonable for us to expect the police to be all and do all mm -hmm. and we all need to play our roles and certainly I think there's a role that the city can play specifically as it relates to identifying resources um, you know working on some kind of technology that has some real-time updates that officers can easily accessibly tap into that can better uh, support folks you know whether they're experiencing intimate uh, partner violence or other challenges, homelessness or other um, crises. So uh, I'm very uh, happy to take uh, some leadership around that and to work with my colleagues and uh, keep members around the table here posted. Thank you. Thank you to Deputy Mayor Morley. And <laughs> you had one more yeah, comment, more comment. Councillor Chain. The reason that you know this is important to me is just because I have stood beside women trying to leave situations, sometimes on a phone or on a chat, um, and. There have been times where they have been told by the police officer responding to say the shelters are full and almost like that's it, go back. 
Um, so that should never be an answer. Uh, and those women that I have been, you know, been a, had the privilege of walking with have been lucky because they have other women behind them helping them to find other resources when an officer says there is no other place for you. So I, that is what the concern is for me, that they, I'm not saying they have to have a Rolodex of every single resource, but the answer should never be you should go back uh, to a place that might be risky. So, um, and maybe that was an anomaly uh, or two, but I just want to make sure that the response is in line with what is available, and if there's a gap there, then we should find what the gap is, and that all officers should make sure that there is no dead end when a, a woman is asking for help. Chair, may I uh, comment? I think it. I, I think I, I feel compelled to say something at this point, um, and that's because uh, I, I want to reassure the board. Um, anecdotally, whatever has been heard is not consistent with the expectation of myself as the chief or this command team on our response to intimate partner violence. And I'd ask that any time board members come with, into those situations to please let us know and we will conduct the appropriate investigations that are required uh, to get to the bottom factually of what happened um, so that we can attend to the matters in the most appropriate way. Uh, but we are committed to uh, responding in the most effective way to intimate partner violence circumstances and sending people back to dangerous circumstances is in no way consistent with the values or governance or my direction or the command's expectation of our members. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, so um, may I have a motion uh, for item uh, number? I do have a quick question. Oh, I, I, I do have a quick question. Let's go Can you ahead. Hear me? Thank you. Yeah, I just wondered when I look at the various data, I, I wondered the, the numbers are always quite high for not having the had the opportunity to apply the training. And I just wondered if there are any primary reasons cited by the members for not applying what they've learned from the training modules. And you know, what are the plans for, for these um, members to have future application of training in the training? It might be, um, so certainly this is an area that um, called staff when they regroup with IS, the ISTP candidates can kind of poke at, but it also is not everyone is always in front facing in the community roles and may not immediately draw the linkage between what maybe they learned last year and what they're applying. Um, recognizing though everyone does receive this training and so it might just be in the last 12 months that there wasn't an opportunity doesn't mean there never will be but certainly this is an area we can um, follow up with our participants on as part of a class discussion thank you may I have a motion to receive item number four uh, um, Councillor Chang, seconded by Deputy Mayor Morley, all in favor, thank you. Um, moving on to um, item number five, which is a report from Chief Demke as it relates to the contract extension and increase with the EJUST systems for the EJUST case management support and maintenance. I understand, Mr. Langenfeld, you have a deputation? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Morgan. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, go, just going back to the uh, discussion the board was just having on that last item, uh, I just wanted to suggest councillors might want to consider having the city develop an app that people can access on their smartphones in order for uh, both users and, and uh, the service and other members of the city to be able to find out what's available in terms of uh, shelter and support services. That uh, That's certainly somewhere where app development would seem uh, useful. And uh, I don't think that needs to cost $700,000 to develop it, but uh, I think you could uh, come up with something useful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, moving on here to uh, item five, um, the... The, there was mention here earlier about um, the uh, uh, disclosure issues with the service, and, and that was brought up. And so uh, last weekend here, there was uh, 
this um, newspaper report about a, uh, a gentleman who was uh, the Toronto Star's headline here from last Saturday is he miraculously survived being shot by strangers. Then the case fell apart over Toronto police incompetence. And the issue there was uh, a lack of uh, disclosure uh, coming from uh, from some of the officers involved. And, of course, we all know that this is a... Uh, um, maybe not a regular occurrence, but it certainly happens all too often. And that ties in with this uh, this software uh, renewal here and, and uh, extension of the contract and modifications. Um, and I don't know if it's the e-just uh, system or if perhaps this is something that uh, should be falling under some of the other software. But, of course, we know the service has uh, all kinds of different uh, applications uh, that they require for their uh, their functions here, and so I'd like to suggest um, I'd like some assurances that there will be modifications to uh, some of this software, whatever is most appropriately appropriate for the task, to automatically produce an uh, alert report every time an officer or a supervisor, whoever's responsible, uh, is overdue on uh, TPS prescribed evidence submission deadlines. Uh, and that should just be something that software is automatically uh, producing a report uh, to notify supervisors when their officers haven't submitted uh, the disclosure evidence to the Crown. And uh, if you're not tracking that, I'd like to suggest that that should be something that we should be tracking uh, in our software systems. And I would uh, also appreciate then if details about what our, um, first of all, what are TPS's instructions to officers about submitting disclosure materials. Uh, I'd, I'd don't believe I've seen that, and it's probably in a procedure somewhere. Uh, but that also leads me to wonder if the chief believes perhaps the service might benefit from the board developing a board policy to establish some guidelines for dates reporting and some disciplinary guidance to aid the service in uh, developing procedures around disclosures of evidence to uh, the Crown and defendants. Uh, and then I would also like to see a report coming to the board uh, filed at the public meetings, I would think quarterly to begin with, and eventually probably uh, annually once we have eight quarters of baseline historical data, uh, reporting the number of disclosures completed on time, the number of cases where disclosures occurred outside of TPS directions, uh, the number of cases where disclosures remained um, and, and that still haven't been made, even though uh, the report's now being made and they're beyond the prescribed uh, timelines for, for disclosing information. Um, and presumably after contacting the Crown to inquire, um, we should have some information on the number of cases where charges were stayed or withdrawn or where a, uh, the court granted an 11B charter application to dismiss because uh, disclosures weren't made and uh, the case got thrown out for delay. Um, plus, I'd like to see a, a summary of the categories for reasons for those delays. Uh, why was it that uh, officers weren't able to complete the disclosures on time? Uh, and then finally, the number of uh, disciplinary actions commenced um, in relation to that and how many of those were informally resolved or formally resolved with the uh, disciplinary charges and what the range of sanctions imposed um, in those uh, in in those cases were not necessarily on a case by case basis but generally what the range of discipline uh, actually administered by the service I know in this uh, Toronto star report uh, one of the issues that the gentleman is, is dealing with, having been uh, shot and having had the case against the people that uh, tried to kill him uh, thrown out because of a lack of disclosures, is he can't even find out uh, what kind of discipline was uh, actually given to the officer responsible for that uh, uh, situation that got the charges thrown out. So needless to say, he's being uh, uh, punished by uh, issues relating to policing, which he shouldn't be suffering from, obviously. He's uh, certainly dealt with enough issues. Um, I, I believe that's my uh, submission on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lagenfeld. Um, um, I can assure you, I don't know this particular case, but I can assure you that every time there's a serious case in the courts where uh, it is dismissed, uh, 
you know, uh, for lack of disclosure or that the trial hasn't taken place in a timely uh, fashion that uh, both uh, the Ministry of the Attorney General or uh, uh, PPSC would review that case with a view to whether or not they're going to appeal it or whether or not there's additional steps that have to be taken on their side or discussions, and I th believe the same thing takes place at um, the Toronto Police Service and other police services because obviously uh, to lose uh, serious cases over what we would, you know, maybe call uh, technical arguments or lack of disclosure are, are considered very serious. Um, and, and so having said that, uh, there are systems in place, uh, checks and balances, but maybe um, Deputy Stairs could talk a little bit to us about um, what what is envisioned in the future for um, updates as it relates to disseminating disclosure and uh, you know, uh, making sure and scrutinizing and monitoring the, the timely dissemination of disclosure. So perhaps Mr. Stairs can just talk about that. Thank you, Chair. Well, I appreciate that. Um, but, uh, part of what we're not seeing is any public release of that information. So uh, that's great that the Crown and the, the service do that <laughs> internally. What's not happening is that getting reported to the board, which makes it public. Um, <laughs> So I think that needs to be uh, included as well. But thank you, and Mr. Sears, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the motion before the board is about uh, the EJUST system and extending the contract for it. Um, uh, because we are, um, in fact, uh, very engaged in trying to work through uh, court and disclosure um, processes and streamlining those. We are meeting regularly. I am meeting regularly with um, uh, MAG. Ministry of the Attorney General um, uh, to look at streamlining um, issues and disclosure is at the center of, of that. I think in, in terms of context, um, the board should understand and the public should understand um, that the uh, volume of disclosure um, is increasing substantially. Um, and that's because of increasing use of video um, and the importance of video um, in um, uh, analyzing um, uh, crimes, crimes of, and events. Um, and that's both seized video, which is video that we um, uh, pull from uh, various cameras that are on scene, as well as the body-worn cameras that we introduced um, for accountability purposes um, in, um, in the service. So that's driving up the amount of, um, of raw footage that we have to go through. Um, and that footage has to be redacted um, to protect the privacy of individuals and the public. Um, and that's a very heavy demand. Um, so that um, abuts the challenge of um, staffing of our, of our CIBs and our investigative services. Um, and so uh, to write this out off as a, a disciplinary issue, um, I think is not recognizing some of the systemic challenges that we have. Um, and those are challenges that we are um, addressing head on with MAG um, to make sure that we are supporting the, uh, the courts as they need to be supported um, with uh, timely evidence. We do have uh, reports um, that uh, look at disclosure, disclosure timeliness. Um, uh, we have the, um, the sort of the provisioning of that disclosure to the courts, as well as um, the feedback if there's any deficiencies against that disclosure, um, uh, which also complicate the, um, the back and forth information. Um, part of what we're trying to do with this is um, uh, um, move our technology forward. So the eJust system is our current state, but we need to move beyond it, um, and that's part of the records management project, um, which um, uh, board members who've been on for a while will know about, and I will brief um, the new board members on um, uh, as the opportunity arises. Um, so that's looking at streamlining our, um, our courts and disclosure processes. Um, the evidence.com system, which we've implemented, is also uh, doing the same, um, and we are building more um, accountability reports into those, um, and I will uh, make um, a summary information available to the board as, as the board directs. Thank you, and I just want to make another point, uh, Mr. Langenfeld, that it's not always an issue of someone not um, uh, being timely in disseminating the disclosure. Uh, as a uh, Deputy Stairs mentioned a lot of the disclosure today um, is um, <coughs> quite complicated. It, for example, may be reports that are generated, for example, from the Center of Forensic Science. They are scientific uh, reports. It may be that within this day of technology, a lot of cases rely on heavily 
on um, cell phone records, social media, and those kind of things, which also requires adequate staffing of, of Toronto Police or any other service for that matter that can actually timely uh, decipher, analyze, and generate reports on these. Uh, you know, with a number of shootings, having adequate staff that, that uh, perhaps can, um, um, you know, uh, uh, generate reports as they relate to uh, possession of firearms, where these firearms came from. So, so that's just something to be mindful as well. It's, it's adequate staffing because often disclosure relies on parties other than the actual investigators themselves uh, to generate that disclosure. And that, that uh, you know, not adequate staffing, and I, I can speak from experience myself having uh, prosecuted for many years that um, sometimes the system, like it, the health system, like many other systems, uh, do not have adequate staff to process these accordingly, despite the fact you may have a rigorous case management system. So I just want to point that out. I appreciate that, but I think that's where having that information um, made public and, and coming out to the board gives you uh, beyond the anecdotal comments of, oh, well, there's these issues and that issues. If the, if the service is actually reporting to the board how many situations was this the cause or that the cause, uh, then you can actually look at trying to address what those causes are, whereas uh, as long as you just say, well, it could be any one of uh, a dozen uh, issues that are causing this, we're never going to actually solve it. We're just going to keep saying, oh, well, what can you do? So thank you for uh, your input uh, and, and your answers there, uh, Chair and uh, Mr. Stairs. Thank you, Mr. Langenfeld. Appreciate those, and we'll continue to uh, be mindful of those situations, uh, especially in those most serious cases. So thank you for your input. Pity Morley. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Chair, through you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that a little bit because I had an idea or question for <laughs> you, um, Chief Information Officer. Um, I am mindful of the advancements in technology. I'm thinking of Google and facial recognition, right? Whenever you get like reminders for whatever this person or whatever the case, right? Uh, I wonder if there's any exploration currently underway around utilizing AI which I know is, can be controversial, but I think can have some really helpful applications as it relates to the challenges that you've articulated around capacity, high dense and high volume of information to be gone through. Um, is there an opportunity, is that being explored? Uh, can you speak to us a little bit about that? Um, uh, yes, absolutely. So as you can imagine, the, um, uh, the, there's significant public concern around policing um, and police using AI. Um, so uh, we have introduced uh, through the board and um, uh, um, uh, through um, uh, the uh, uh, through Doobie and myself, our, our work on the AI ML policy um, and the procedure that um, subordinates that, um, and what we we do in the service. So essentially, that um, uh, looks to make visible to the board and to the public and through consultations uses of AI ML. Um, and we're developing um, the list of all the AIs that we use in service to bring forward to the board um, and make a public release. Um, uh, the, uh, the AI in this particular use around um, a disclosure, um, the main activity that, uh, that challenges us is um, redaction, um, redaction of video. So we are starting to see um, uh, AIs that are built into uh, redaction studios, um, and we are starting to look at, um, at, at using those. They aren't as functional and useful as we'd like them to be. Um, you can imagine if an officer were to um, pass their body-worn camera across um, a report or someone's cell phone that had information on it that needed to be redacted, how's the AI supposed to figure out whether that needs to be re redacted or not? But certainly um, the use of AI in redaction is going to be um, a lifesaver in terms of, of reducing that labor um, on, on the front line. Um, it's not going to be a magic or silver bullet or magic wand or whatever you want to call it, um, but it will help. Um, and we are looking at AIs in a bunch of different areas, um, conscious of the board's um, policy and conscious of the risk management and what the public would, um, would want us to be using. Thank you. I'm sorry, Chief. <laughs> I, I did want to just add one more point, and I think um, it bears mentioning that uh, the Police Service Board's actually been a leader in police governance as it relates to AI across the country. 
I think, uh, groundbreaking, frankly, in the development of policy and procedure. And you ought to know that we are connected with our policing partners across the country on this. And um, uh, CIO Stairs is a leader in this field. Um, and uh, in fact, I go to national meetings where they cite his work, um, which uh, quite frankly makes us all very proud. But you should know that we're very engaged in that. And it is an evolving field, albeit difficult field for us, given the fact that uh, there are public concerns. Councilor Burnside, did you have a comment or question? I uh, minor more uh, questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I apologize uh, because, as you know, I'm new. So if there's a report you just want to point me to, I'm good. Um, but just this kind of uh, scratches the surface, this discussion about the increased complexity of police investigations, whether it's a fatality, impaired, you know, video, all the, you, you name it. Is there a report on, and new procedures I mean, the list goes on, right? But is there a report that looks at you know, the changes over let's, whatever time period, let's say it's 25 years, of the, that lays out two things. One, the increased administrative cost to police service uh, of all these things, you know, redaction, whatever, you name it. Um, and, or, and the second point, is there, is there anything that speaks to the amount of time that a, that a regular officer in a car is actually does spent doing reports now versus let's 20 say 25 years ago because uh, i keep coming back to the budget and it seems like we keep piling on these things and um i you know i just know from my own experience that no you know impairs and it were three hours where they used when people would say well 20 years ago they're an hour maybe that's anecdotal i don't know but i just know from all the things that are going on that it would be really valuable as we talk about police budgets to understand you know those those things like the administrative administrative burden that is placed on the police service now as opposed to the past because we always talk about budgets from the past and how they've escalated but I don't think the public has a, and I certainly don't, has a really good understanding of, you know, those administrative uh, burdens and the costs that are associated with it. Uh, sure, um, I, we did do a review of response times, um, and response times are from um, uh, when the 911 call is, is responded to to um, uh, when the officer shows up. Um, at the event, but as part of that, we're also looking at um, where our resourcing is um, and um, and uh, the length of time that is being spent on scene once arrived, and that is growing. Um, in part, that's documentation. In part, that's changes to policy um, that are requiring more steps and more activities to be done as part of um, uh, policing reforms. Many of those come from uh, the 81 recommendations. So we are definitely seeing a lengthening um, of the time on scene um, that are due to um, uh, those factors. Um, they might also be related to um, the um, uh, the years of service. Um, we're getting younger officers, newer officers, um, uh, um, as an average is coming down. So that is um, is driving it, and that showed up both in our own analysis of response times as well as the Auditor General's um, review of um, uh, 911 operations and um, and 911 response. So we are seeing um, trend there, um, and I can say um, that as we as my portfolio is looking at. Um, uh, information management, um, the probably the most resonant issue with the front line is what we call the job, not the paperwork, um, and trying to reduce um, duplication, triplication of um, a documentation. Um, and that's a central focus of the records management project, trying to get to digital um, officer notes um, and eliminate the, uh, the duplication of documentation so we can return that time to the front line. Right, thank you, but I, I recognize I recognize the trend, I think, but that's not what I'm really asking. I'm really asking, have you actually quantified it? And the answer is no, that's not a problem. I just, I think it's just a valuable thing to, if it can even be done, I don't know that it can be done. Yeah, I think it is a complicated bit of work. Um, so I think the takeaway for us will be to look to see if there's any reports produced by MAG or other institutional bodies in this regard, which very, much, very well may be available for us. Um, but I think uh, I want to pick up on one point, and um, we reference it often as report taking. And I think the one thing that I would, uh, we're trying to drive a different language around that activity. That activity is not report taking, that activity is documenting your investigation. And it is a fundamental shift in what's expected of our officers. 
uh, and that fundamental shift is driven by the reality of the court experience. Uh, for example, as a young constable, I would testify sometimes three or four different courtrooms. Today, I don't expect anybody's doing much of that, and that's because trials take much longer now. Where you might have one court here, two or three impaired trials in a day, in years gone by, now it might take a day or two to do the same single trial. So the complexity of what's expected of all justice participants in a courtroom has absolutely changed. That is compounded, of course, by the technological data evidence we're collecting uh, and what's expected of our frontline police officers. The level of service we expect our cops to deliver each and every call is considerably different today than it was 20 years ago. And what's expected of them to, to document their investigation and be tested on it with veracity and testify to it is different today than it was 20 years ago. Um, so. I think it's a great opportunity for us to look to quantify that change. Uh, but I'm highlighting that change because it is fundamental to our operations. Uh, every police officer's role has changed and evolved. And, um, and what's expected of them to, to actually present in a courtroom to be tested um, is considerably different. Um, and where, where before something would take a confined period of time now takes longer, for sure. Right, and the level of expertise of, of any Absolutely. I guess where, and where I'm going with that question is that when you read the paper, everything is about increased increasing efficiency, reducing times, which is great, which is what's being done, but so people walk away, think I would, as a general uh, reader of a newspaper, that actually everything is getting shorter, whereas in fact, the, all the requirements are actually making it everything longer. And I just think that needs to be captured. I think just the, the, the debate, you know, you, I think you know what I'm saying, right, Chief? I, I think that's an incredible point that we have to stay mindful of and, and do our work to try to quantify wherever we possibly can the change in dynamic. Uh, but anecdotally, of course, we know. We know today we expect different from our police officers. And that doesn't come without its complexities and, and strain on time. Right, and I would think that on any particular investigation, I'll keep coming back to impaired, but that would be a fairly, you know, you can, one could probably look and see how, how long an impaired investigation took 25 years ago compared to now. I think that kind of information would be helpful. It would inform the debate regarding your budget. The five-page crown brief is now a, a textbook. <laughs> Thank you. And just want to say that uh, in my own experience that with all these challenges, those kind of stories are actually in the minority. And I think there is a data you can collect from Meg that will tell you uh, what, what the rate, not of 11B applications or lack of disclosure motions, it's those that which were successful on the defense side which uh, ends up having a case lost. They still are in the overwhelming, very small minority. So I just want to give uh, TPS a tribute to that because I know how difficult it is. So just what they mount and hopefully some of our new technology systems, I'm looking forward to them uh, to actually make the officers' lives uh, easier. So may I have a motion to receive this report, please? Item number five, um, Councillor Chang, seconded by uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Morley. Thank you. And now we move to uh, item number seven. This was the uh, report from Chief Demke as it related to the jury recommendations in the um, coroner's inquest in, into Mr. Uh, Baker's death. And I believe, Councillor Chang, you had a question or a comment? Just a quick question. This is on, on page 19 of the recommendations. It was for Waterloo Police um, that to ensure that any officer involved in a situation in which they are required to draw their firearm as a result of threat of seriously bot, serious bodily harm or death shall receive a documented debrief with a supervisor prior to their next shift. And I'm just wondering, does that happen um, within our services? Do police officers who are required uh, to have to draw their firearm, do they get a debrief, a documented debrief with a supervisor following drawing of a firearm? Good morning. Um, currently, if uh, there is a discharge of a firearm, there is a return to work uh, debriefing that happens with the officer. As far as uh, pulling your firearm, um, 
and it not being discharged, we currently do not have a required debrief to return back to active duty. So it's only if it's fired, but not if it's drawn, is that correct? That's correct. Um, and just wondering in that debrief, is, it, uh, is there a mental health lens also? So not just the moment and the, like what happened, but cause you know, it's quite traumatic and we see the impact on mental health of so many of our officers. Is there the mental health piece also debriefed with the officer? It is Ms. Chang. That is really wonderful to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. And just maybe also to add, uh, if I'm correct, that every time an officer as well uh, either uh, fires a weapon or pulls a weapon or uses a, a, a CEW device, there's also a corresponding use of force report that must be generated as well as, as the debriefs uh, in, in the superintendent's uh, situations that uh, he outlined. So. So thank you. Those were uh, walk-on items. So uh, number nine, I wonder if we could have a motion uh, as it related to, um, um, sorry, seven, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself, for um, the response to the jury recommendations into the coroner's inquest of Mr. Baker. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chang, seconded by Deputy Mayor Morley. Thank you. And then, uh, one of the final uh, agenda items was the walk-in report number nine. It was um, the report from uh, Duby Can and Gisser as it related to the City Council decision MM11.37, keeping Toronto safe from hate. Um, before we go on to approve, I believe, um, Councillor Chang, you said you wanted to make a comment. Um, I, I just wanted to take the moment to thank the police services uh, for I know all the thoughtfulness um, that has been applied at the last week in consideration of global events and um, I know that this motion um, you know it, it, it was uh, a reflection of what was happening uh, and I have full confidence that uh, our police services will be uh, supporting um, the fight against hate in our city. So I just wanted to take this moment to thank because we, you know, had a emergency board uh, briefing uh, on uh, last weekend, and just how so many people gave up their Thanksgiving weekend and came to the front lines in a huge mobilization across our city. So uh, thank you for all your efforts, your sacrifice, uh, and we see that, you know, indeed many community members feel very supported, uh, and I know that we will all work together to fight hate in our city. Thank you, Councillor Chang, for those uh, kind remarks. Um, may I have a motion to approve? This would be add-on, walk-on number nine. Um, Deputy Morley, um, <laughs> seconded by uh, Nick Migliori. All in favor? And I believe that completes our last um, agenda item. And at this time, can I have a motion to adjourn? Um, Deputy Mayor Morley. And the next regular board meeting takes place here, uh, Thursday, November 23rd. That adjourns our meeting. Thank you. <laughs>